thanks so much for taking time early morning to talk toxic yeah. chemicals yeah. in children's clothing. You know, a good topic to Bye. start the day, uh, because why not? Um, and it's very important. We've been at it for, for quite a bit. So um, I guess maybe just, you know, to get started, I can, I can intro myself a little bit, you know, give a, a few more seconds for Perfect. people to join, and then we can get started. But uh, so I'm Ali, I'm the founder of AppChoose, uh, which is a company that uh, aims to, you know, promote, encourage sustainable living and consumption. Um, the way we you know, aim to do that is we try to design and create services that everyday people can use to lower waste, to be more efficient with resources, to consume in a more intelligent way, hopefully. And we do this through life moments, starting with the very beginning, birth. So that's what got us to, um, you know, to focus <laughs> on, on, on birth, on babies. And uh, essentially what we have, the first service that, that we've been operating for the past couple of years is a, a, a circular subscription service for uh, cot certified organic baby clothing, which is basically a way to try to combine both uh, reuse uh, and, um, you know, high quality organic brands that are usually, you know, pretty ex expensive. And we can, you know, get back to that, but that's, you know, from where we, we have been uh, interested in this topic. Um, and so we've been talking about toxic chemicals in children clothing for years, but we don't always have a chance to speak with a biochemist, you know, about it. So, uh, maybe today is a good chance to go a little bit more in, yeah, in, in anyway. like the details, um, and the science of it. Uh, but yeah, the, 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 you know, it's a really good opportunity <laughs> to have you. Thank you for, for being with me and with us. Um, uh, and yeah, just to get started, I'm, I'm you know, curious how, what made you, if you want to treat yourself and what made you want to be you know, a biochemist and how does a biochemist start to focus Absolutely. On, on well, clothing. thank you for having me and it's so great to connect with you. Um, so my name is Lydia. Yeah. Um, I am a biochemist. That's what my background is in looking at metabolic processes, how nutrients and also toxins impact our environment, but most importantly, our bodies. Um, so I started out in cancer research, looking at leukemia cells and the impact of cholesterol on leukemia cells. I studied um, a lot about nutrition and again, a lot about toxins. I knew a lot about how these things are in our foods and beauty products, <clears throat> but I came across an article about four years ago that talked about bamboo and how there's a lot of toxic chemicals that are endocrine disrupting chemicals needed to add to the bamboo in order to make it soft enough to wear because it's not inherently a soft enough fiber for a fabric. Yeah. And when I yes. saw this information, I just thought, oh, that's such a blind spot in our environment of saying, we know to look at food and beauty products and even now cooking wear, but we just didn't know that clothing can impact our health. And so from there, I just went down a deep rabbit hole of looking into all of the different toxins that are used in our clothing. This information is <clears throat> new. It's really something that we're just starting to look into. And it's just been so exciting to use my background in science to see how can we choose clothing that's actually healthier for us because there are healthier alternatives out there and we don't have to be wearing toxins every day. So if we, you know, when we get used to talk about like toxic chemicals in clothing, we forget sometimes to go back to basics, right? And to like even uh, remember or explain what we mean by toxins uh, or even, you know, chemicals or even clothing, you know, because we don't necessarily really know or if we don't, you know, think hard mm -hmm. about it, what, what clothing is, right? Uh, in terms of material, in terms of, um, you know, fabric or fiber. So if like, how do you explain that to, you know, I was going to say 10 year old, yeah. maybe this so, one. So I mean, everything <laughs> in the world has a chemical structure. So we can't say that all chemicals are bad because everything is made up of chemicals. But when we're talking about toxic chemicals, those are ones that we've seen can negatively impact our health in different ways. If they are impacting our endocrine system, reproductive system, metabolic processes. So that's where that comes in. So if we just say chemicals are bad, that's definitely not something that's true because again, we're all all made up of molecular compounds that are put together into chemicals. But where these come into our clothing is, if you think about a piece of cotton, it's not inherently bright pink, it's not inherently moisture wicking. And so we have to think about what is giving our clothing these properties that we desire. We want things to be stain resistant. We want them to have you know beautiful colors and prints, but you have to think about what are the additives being used in the production process that actually give them these properties. And what we're starting to see is a lot of these Properties are from toxic chemicals. They're from items that are endocrine disrupting, that can impact growth and development in children, that can impact children's immune response, um, that can impact their ability to actually take two vaccines. And so as this information is coming out, because they've been so widely used in our clothing, and of course, after something's used for a long period of time, we see years later what the actual implications are. And that's where we're at now is seeing 
in our clothing, so many are plastic based, meaning literally taking crude oil, making it into plastic and then turning it into fibers, taking that same base and making it into dyes that we like for the bright colors or for, you know, a print on a T-shirt. And so that's where we're starting to see a bit of an issue come into our clothes weren't always made out of these materials, but it's just something that's been happening, especially since about like the 1950s, bringing into plastic and polyester and nylon becoming a really big part of our everyday wardrobe. And so the question here now is, you know, what do you actually want to wear? What do you want to take into your system? Because we're seeing research that shows when you're sweating in something, when you're wearing it for long periods of times, it can actually take that chemical that's on the fabric. <clears throat> Same with kids. You know, if they're wearing something for a long period of time, putting it in their mouth, you know, they're on the floor taking in different things. All of these things can start to get into their system. And I think the biggest thing to talk about when right then and there, these chemicals can be much, much harsher on their system than they are in adults. They have, you know, growth and development that they're going through. They're just starting to build up their immune system. And so if these chemicals already can impact your immune system and you're, and it's being taken into a child that doesn't have a full immune system yet, it can really wreak havoc. Um, so that's where we're at in, you know, where do these clothing, these chemicals even get into our clothing? Because I think that question comes up a lot of people saying, <clears throat> why are they even there? I didn't even think of that. So that's really where we want to start that conversation. So, 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 so yeah, why are they even there, right? Like, why do we have so many mm -hmm. toxic chemicals? In yeah, chemicals? I mean, the biggest thing is plastic-based fabrics, plastic-based dyes are cheaper. They're easier to get in abundance. <clears throat> They're cheaper for companies to use in clothing and in all different aspects of production. So we see polyester and that's a plastic based fiber and that's the biggest most you know 60 percent of clothing yeah. on the market is made out of polyester it's because it's yeah. so cheap so easy to use so easy to use in multiple different ways um that's a really big one and then we see things like formaldehyde which is a treatment used on clothing to make them wrinkle resistant and you know for adults you want something to be wrinkle resistant but even in children's clothing it's used a lot for wrinkle or stain resistant properties and formaldehyde can really impact the skin like yeah. it can be a dermatitis in, um, inducing chemical and it can also impact the respiratory system especially on kids as well and so we're seeing okay we want certain certain clothes to have certain properties we want an abundance of clothes because we're in this overconsumption market how can companies make that in a cheap way and in a quick way and so they're using cheaper synthetic toxins yeah. in order to put clothing together in a very easy way to give consumers what they want without giving the information where I think if a price tag or you know a clothing tag said made with formality something that someone would pick up and take home from them on their shop. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting when we were doing our like initial research for our shoes and, and looking at fabrics, uh, one of the very first and surprising learning was what you mentioned around polyester being 60% of the market. And, you know, I think cotton being nearly the remaining 40% and uh, everything else, you know, that we know about and that we're familiar about, be it linen, silk, wool um everything else mm -hmm. is is such mm -hmm. a tiny you know part of what of what we produce um and when it comes to cotton the second you know surprising learning also is that there's a huge difference between uh conventional cotton and traditional cotton uh, or conventional cotton and organic cotton and organic cotton has been you know from our perspective what we see is that it's been a little bit marketed as a mm -hmm. quasi you know luxury you know something high-end or something glamorous that um you build a brand around as opposed to what should be you know, just the normal standard, because why would you want to have, you know, toxic stuff in your, in your clothes? So, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear how you think about, um, about even the difference between cotton and organic cotton, because one thing that's interesting, I've done the experience once is like, go to a Macy's and say, I'm looking for children's clothing and I, I, I want organic cotton because it's a safer fabric. And they would direct me to hundred percent cotton. And I would ask, oh, so does that mean organic cotton? And they would say, yes, if it's hundred percent cotton, oh, that's what it means. It means organic cotton. Wow. Um, and so it's very widely, you know, mm -hmm. miss. Yeah, it really is. No, if something says 100% cotton, it doesn't mean how it was farmed. So it can definitely be conventionally grown, meaning with pesticides. <clears throat> and that is the main difference if you just want to know at a baseline, conventional versus organic. Conventional uses like the pesticides and the herbicides in the farming production, and organic cotton does not. They use more natural or herbicides and pesticides versus those synthetic materials. And so right then and there in the baseline of fabric production, we have a toxin. Pesticides, pesticides have been linked to endocrine disruption versus organic cotton, which are not. And those are used, they use more natural methods for insecticides and herbicides. 
So this is where we can have a toxin that's getting into our environment and indirectly impacting our health. So pesticides can run off in wastewater, get into waterways that are nearby <clears throat> and impact communities, impact food that you end up eating later, you know, the fish or different water that you're taking in that you're having later. Pesticides in conventional cotton, because of their endocrine disrupting qualities, can be more negative to wear. We haven't seen direct relation between wearing a pesticide treated cotton based piece of clothing and a health impact because usually by the time it gets to your clothing a lot of that pesticide is at least more embedded in the clothing or um, wicked off but organic cotton because of the measures taken especially if something is GOTS certified the GOTS certification looks at a lot of the different chemicals being used including dyes and finishes in the process to make sure that's something that's healthier for you to wear so if you're looking for organic yeah. cotton it's definitely good to look for something that is certified organic because anyone can say something is a material without having that there's really no government regulation on a final piece of clothing to test it to make sure oh is this actually you know what they're saying it is which is why we want to look for those certifications like the gots certification, which just confirms that in the farming process all organic measurements were used all the way up until it's made into a piece of clothing uh, cotton in general is better for sensitive skin so again it's better on children um, and organic cotton really just takes it to the next level to make sure it's safer on their sensitive skin. Um, it's more breathable. So it's really a, a primary fiber that you would want in your child, uh, child's wardrobe. Okay, so if I try to go back and again, like uh, try to cover really the basics, uh, what we said is that, you know, chemicals are an essential part of, of everything, you know, around us. Uh, certain chemicals can be, you know, toxic. And the, the reason why we have so much in our clothing is partly because more than half of the clothing we produce is derived from petroleum. So by nature, you know, it is, it is a, a um, process that involves toxic chemicals. And then almost half of it is, you know, conventional cotton that is grown with a lot of insecticides and pesticides. And on top of that, you know, on the one hand, clothing is always, you know, colored and printed on, et cetera, which involves a lot of chemicals. Uh, but we also constantly, which is something I think is really interesting, we, we're constantly looking for new nice features to increase our mm -hmm. comfort almost, right? Like we want things or, or we market things to be stain resistant. Like that's the, that's, you know, that's one of the big ones, right? Like uh, if you see something that says stain resistant, it, you know, means that there's some potentially hazardous or toxic chemicals uh, that have been using, used to, you know, to create that outcome, which is, you know, a nice right. place to have, let's say, right? Like th this isn't something that we, like the trade-off seems very asymmetrical there, right? Like I would rather not have stain resistant um, and, and, and avoid avoid, you know, toxic chemicals. So we know like, okay, we have those chemicals that are embedded in the manufacturing uh, and growing of fabrics all the way to, to, to that fabric becoming, becoming a clothes. Now, uh, um, a piece of clothing. Now in terms of the families, and that's where sometimes it becomes really complicated, right? Because we hear like in terms of families of, of those chemicals and what they're linked to, we hear formaldehyde, phthalates, forever <laughs> chemicals, like there's all these like names. And at first when I, as a company, we started doing this research, we thought, you know, why do we make things that complicated? It's obvious that, you know, the, the, the person who's like in our case, for example, the, 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 the parent or the mother is just having a baby or expecting a baby, you know, isn't going to be able to, um, or willing some, some are, of course, but the majority won't, won't enter into understanding the families of chemicals. So why is it that complicated and what, like, how do we make the bridge between uh, that complexity and just understanding in a in a simple way those like yeah so i would say chemicals. the easiest way to think of it is the majority of toxic chemicals <clears throat> used in clothing production go under the umbrella of endocrine disruptors and that can impact reproduction fertility thyroid hormone levels you know any sort of hormone levels in your body so that's i mean that includes formaldehyde pesticides phthalates pfas the forever chemicals bpa all the big ones that you're seeing on the news are these endocrine disrupting chemicals, and they all have their space in clothing production for various reasons of if they are either, in the case of phthalates, making a PVC plastic more flexible to wear. So you'll see that more in shoes, like those jelly shoes that kids wear, or in you know purses or something that's more of an accessory, or even a vinyl raincoat that's you know very plastic based. And then again, we talked about formaldehyde with their resistant qualities, and then PFAS all across the board. In children's wear from school uniforms to raincoats. Those are used for their water wicking properties. So again, you'll see that a lot in any rainwear or outerwear or something like that. So it's definitely very overwhelming. It feels like you have to throw out your entire closet and start over. What I try to tell people is just go back to the basics. You know, when you're shopping, look for things that are organic cotton. I think the great thing is that a lot of clothing companies are starting to understand the use of all these toxic chemicals and have more labels. There's a lot of companies out there that will say BPA free or PFAS free 
Um, they'll even say, you know, vinyl free, so no phthalates. And so it's really just a matter of kind of following these certifications and following these tags to see, okay, what can I shop to make things just easier for myself? But if you, first of all, just try to avoid synthetics, that's a really good first step to start. Avoiding polyester mm -hmm. and other synthetics means that you're also avoiding dispersed dyes, which can be skin sensitizers, which can be tough on children's skin. And so if you're just right then and there, you're like, you know, I'm just going to avoid polyester as much as I can. That's a really good first start. And I'm going to opt for organic cotton. Um, other things to look for are if you see those big logos on t-shirts or prints, a lot of the time phthalates are used for those because they're more plastic based. So maybe avoid those. So different little things like that, that you can just start yes. to build a cleaner wardrobe for your family. Another thing, if you're really concerned, is to look for something that's undyed, because then you're just taking out of the equation all of those toxic dyes. But there are some non-toxic dyes out there as well. And I know kids like to wear bright colors and have fun with their clothing. So you definitely don't want to lose that fun aspect that clothing is mm -hmm. meant to have, where it's really meant to show that personality and have a good time with what you're wearing and have that you know, artistry and creativity in it. So there are just these smaller things to look for. Again, I can repeat, I, I said, avoiding synthetics as you can, looking for pieces that are organic cotton, look for pieces that might say BPA free, PFAS free, um, and look for certifications like GOTS for organic cotton. There's the Ecotex certification that tests for thousands of different chemicals. So look mm -hmm. for their Ecotex standard 100. And that shows that there's a lot of toxic chemicals that are tested mm -hmm. and made sure they're not in the piece of clothing. And the third is a blue sign certification, which really looks at clean chemistry, especially when it comes to dyes. So when you know what to look for, it does get a little bit easier because you can just have these check marks of yes. things of saying, okay, this has these different items. And not every item is going to be perfect and they're not all gonna have all of the things that I mentioned. But if you're slowly starting to just look for these little items, mm -hmm. it'll just in general, make your wardrobe healthier and easier to follow. And I've even put together a downloadable guide that's a shopping guide that has all this information that you can kind of take when you're shopping to say, you know, to remind you, because this is all embedded in my brain, but I'm, <laughs> I don't expect everyone to remember all of these different things out there. And it's definitely very yeah. overwhelming, especially as parents, when you have so many other things in your mind, other than what is in your children's clothing, you know, this is just another issue that we're adding on um, to everyone's life yeah no absolutely and you know i feel sometimes the missing link in that is to explain how those chemicals mm -hmm. um end up in our, our system because there's an assumption uh, that for something to have an impact there needs to be like for example you need to eat it right like someone commented a few days ago on a, on a story i don't know if you've seen that but i think i've already mentioned that but uh, you know, someone else was talking about the same issue and, and they got the comment from someone, you know, the usual comment of uh, very sarcastic, like, you know, you're aware you are only uh, supposed to wear <laughs> the clothes. You're not supposed yeah. to eat them. Right. Right. And right. it's very, very telling, um, you know, <laughs> obviously, you know, it's, it's the kind of comment where, you know, you're, you're, you're ready to, to, to respond to that because you're getting so much of that, I'm sure. But um, it also, you know, revealed that we are wired by now to just assume like, okay, something I eat is probably going to have a health impact. Like if I drink alcohol, if I eat, you know, something, uh, uh, you know, toxic, I can, I can, it can have a health impact, but if I only wear something, you know, what does it have to do with, um, what ends up in my, in my system? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I've definitely gotten comments like that too. And it's, it's almost funny because it's just, I would understand where someone's coming from, where they think it's just preposterous. How can that possibly impact my health? No one's ever talked about this before. We've been wearing clothes forever. Why is the problem now? Well, yeah. I think we have to remember that our skin is our largest absorbing organ and you're wearing clothes 24 seven. And so you're sleeping in them, you're working out in them. And yeah. as you go out throughout your day, you're sweating in them. And again, studies have shown that sweat can pull these chemicals off of fabrics and can get into our system. And so that's really where we're coming into seeing these impacts of these chemicals getting in. It's not that when you wear something, all of a sudden a chunk of your you know, sleeve is gonna be in your system. It's just these topical chemicals that are used as dyes, as finishes in the production can just get off of the fabric and can get into your system because you know your skin is always absorbing what you're coming into contact with. And so the problem just lies in the fact that when you're wearing something consistently, especially this is why I tell people to look at, you know, what are you working out in? What are you sleeping in? Look at those two things first, because you're either high sweat or you're in them for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just a matter of seeing that when you're wearing something for a long period of time, it's just these fabrics don't just stay, you know, these chemicals don't just stay in the fabric. They can easily get off and can get into your system. And that's the, where the issue lies, especially if something is a finishing treatment. So when I say finishing treatment, that just means at the end, right before it becomes your clothing, it's either, you know, the dye that's being put on or the finish that's making it either water wicking or stain resistant or all those different things that we talked about before. Mm -hmm. And those are right topically on your clothing. So 
when you first get home, it's good to wash your clothing just to really get rid of that top layer of chemicals because they're always coming off. But just in general, if you can avoid those different things and you can avoid increasing the amount that's getting into your system. And I think the other part of what you said was, you know, I think that there's a common misconception that, oh, if it's just a little bit, I'm just wearing this once in a while, it's not going to harm me. But there's no safe yeah. amount of these endocrine disrupting and carcinogenic chemicals. They can build up in your system and they all act in different ways. Some like PFAS, which are also known as forever chemicals, they're talked about as forever chemicals because they yeah. are not metabolized out of your body because they stay in your body or in your environment virtually forever, where something like BPA mm -hmm. might be metabolized quickly. The only thing is, is that when it is in your system, what is it doing? Even if BPA is metabolized quickly, it can impact your health. We've seen studies that show that a woman who's pregnant, she comes into contact with BPA, it might be able to impact the genome, possibly result in disease issues later in life. And so because there's no safe amount of all of these chemicals that are in our clothing, when you're coming into contact with them, they can be accumulating every day, even if you're metabolizing them out, or maybe they're staying in, depending again on their chemical structure and how they're impacting with your body and how long you're wearing them. There's so many different factors, which is why it's so hard to say it's this exact yeah. one thing for all chemicals because they all act differently. Yeah. But yeah, so again, just to recap, it's two part. Chemicals can get off of fabrics and can get into your system. Your skin is so absorbent. And these chemicals, there's no safe amount to. They are getting into your system. They can wreak havoc in the short term as well as in the long term. And you know, like a framework that helped me a lot to uh, approach that question initially for me, you know, in in doing our initial research, but also in communicating that is the the concept mm -hmm. of chemical load, um, which I mean, I'll tell you my understanding of it, which is I always tell you know our let's say potential members or or members or parents. No, like nothing bad is going to happen from wearing a bad onesie, you know? Uh, it's not a question of you're going to wear the wrong type of clothing and you're going to be negatively, you know, impacted from a health perspective. However, you have to think about this in accumulation or in addition to everything else that you're doing right. and then over time, right? Because if you are wearing, breathing, uh, being constantly exposed, you know, to uh, toxic substances, and if you are doing that for years, you know, like all the time, that load becomes something that creates a problem. So you want to find a way to, it's not like a, a single decision, right? It's not like you're going to wear that piece of clothing instead of that other one, but it's, it's in terms of moving that load to be something that's, uh, you know, that hopefully you reduce and that is not mm -hmm. uh, significant as opposed to, you know, building up over time. Um, so, so yeah, I don't know if you, if, if you, if you use that, uh, in your communication sometimes of, or, or to what extent that, that is, mm -hmm. uh, sound, uh, do you... uh, okay. So, um, now I want to talk about babies a little bit, because the interesting thing is, um, is, uh, I'm just making sure you hear, yes. you can hear, hear me. You went in and out for a minute there, but I can hear you now. Okay. Yes. Okay, um, so there's all this 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 talk about um, you know sustainable fashion and avoiding toxic chemicals in clothing, and sometimes um, you know I intervene in some of these discussions, and then I say, okay, well now imagine for babies, right? Like if you think this is a problem, now imagine having a bigger problem and a much smaller defense, you know, uh, against that problem. And so um, yeah, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that in terms of um you know how much the load or the exposure can be more important because simply you know you have a, a, a smaller you know body mass uh you know to to be <laughs> just very very uh practical uh while also and you touch upon it a little bit earlier having you know babies have their immune system that are still developing so they they're, they're not able to cope um in the same way as adults so that yeah, I, I'd love to have your, your explanation yeah. of that. No, and, and you summarized it very well, but yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of different factors. There is, again, the body mass of children is just so much smaller. And so when the same amount of chemical or concentration of that chemical is near them, near their system versus an adult, it can have much bigger impacts um, on their body now and later because they're going through developmental, developmental and growth impacts. Some of these chemicals can already get in the way of those, such as PFAS and especially phthalates, if they get into contact with phthalates. Phthalates can impact development in anyone, 
but if it's in a children a child who is already going through this developmental and growth period every single day it can really decrease their ability to go through this their ability to you know metabolize it can have neurological impact so really just anything in their body it can impact if they're consistently getting into contact with these chemicals um, PFAS and formaldehyde have also been shown to impact immune response. So just like you said, they have such a sensitive immune system and they're just getting to know the world around them. And if they're getting in contact with these toxic chemicals that can impact their ability to build a strong immune system, especially like you said, if they're wearing a piece of clothing or getting into contact with something over time, it's every day, you know, it's almost like their immune system is fighting to grow and to strengthen. And this chemical is dampering that ability to do that. And again, we don't know the exact amount. It, it has so many different factors of how much are they exposed to this chemical, how much is it, you know, accumulated in their system. But again, as I said, no amount of these chemicals are safe. And so that's really, you know, something that you'd want to avoid when you want your child to grow up healthy and strong. So again, it's their immune response, their body mass, their ability to just go through um, developmental changes and um, strengthening of their mental functions and their body, that these chemicals can just kind of be at war and dampering their ability to grow strong. And again, the younger they are, again, the even more sensitive they are to all of these different chemicals. And then you look at their skin, they have such sensitive skin, which is why you'd want to wear something like organic cotton that's really just breathable for them. And if you're putting, you know, a polyester, polyester is well at all. It is really not you know, sensitive on your skin. It has those dispersed dyes that can be skin sensitizing. Um, and that's, again, just could result in a dermatitis or just like an irritation. And if they are in contact with these things at a young age, it might impact their ability to be in contact with them in the future because their body is just not able to have this strong immune response to be able to build in order to fight these toxic chemicals in the future, which is why it's just so wonderful everything that you're doing at UpChoose to be able to provide them with healthier options so that they can you. you know, really grow strong and have in all of these different areas um, without their body worrying about being in contact and fighting these toxins. You know, They just wanna get used to the world and have their immune response be able to grow and strengthen without being at war with something yeah. that's in their environment and in their system every day. Yeah, no, thank you. And, um, you know, it's interesting because, um, I mean, things I want to mention because we're 40 minutes into, into the hour. So, you know, if anyone has a, has a question for, for you or for either of us, you know, you can drop it here or you can contact us afterwards. Uh, but also, um, you know, we're talking about issues that can be quite concerning, especially if you're an expecting parent, right? And um, there's often, I must say, we I, I must say we don't we don't get that too much ourselves as a company. But there's, um, you know, I don't want to say accusation, but let's say you know, critique or complain of brands mm -hmm. doing thing mongering sometimes, right? Like, yes. uh, scaring people off, right? And we're always trying to to walk, you know, that fine line between saying uh, we don't want to just you know scare people because. Um, we understand like, you know, especially if you work a lot with, with like new parents, at some point you, you realize everyone is, sure. you know, doing their best. There's only so much you can get right. You're not going to get everything right. And it's true that it can be, you know, extremely stress, stressful and, uh, uh, and, and, and create a lot of anxiety to have, you know, because someone, you know, is talking to you about clothing and someone else is talking to you about the, you know, the air you're breathing and someone else is talking to you about something else. So, uh, we're always trying to walk that fine line between, um, you know, not scaring mm -hmm. people too much, but also being responsible, right? Like those issues exist. We have to address them. We're talking about something that's not trivial. You know, baby's health is not something that is uh, trivial. So we have to be, you know, responsible, uh, especially if we are um, trying to propose a, an alternative to it, right? Um, so I don't know if you're experiencing that as well, if you're getting some pushback of of that nature and how do you yeah do and you i can it? sympathize you... because you know it feels like just another battle in our lives every day to be able to figure out you know we have known recently about nutrition and beauty products all this information is coming out about cooking and then now we're talk talking about clothing and it just feels like you know which battle should i fight today there's just too many options every day it's very overwhelming yeah. um so i absolutely understand where people are coming from especially if they are new parents and everything is already so stressful and overwhelming and this is where i say you really have to just start small start simple you know look to see what are the pieces that you know your child is wearing most often and maybe that's where you start to swap things out maybe it's not this maybe it's their you know something that they're sleeping in every day or even the sheets that they're sleeping on and so if you can just start to swap out for healthier choices in these 
areas that they are coming into mm -hmm. contact with more often, that's a really good first place to start. It doesn't mean that you have to take your whole wardrobe, throw it out and start over because, you know, really that time wise, money wise, I wouldn't even know where to start. So if you really just start small of, you know, what's in our environment the most often every day and what can I switch for something that's a healthier alternative, that's a really good place to start. And that's a little bit more accessible for everyone to do. And no one's wardrobe is perfect. You know, it's really hard to find something that's 100% synthetic free for every single item in your wardrobe. So again, just choose that organic cotton, yeah. non-toxic dyes, avoid the resistance of, you know, that marketing of stain resistant, wrinkle resistant when you can. Um, more often than not, just keep things in your mind as you're shopping moving forward of being able to make a little bit more of conscious decisions. But don't worry about the fact that, you know, out of all of the options in the world, it is definitely more challenging at the moment to find healthier alternatives. So if you just start small specific items, it's yeah. definitely easier to be able to bring that into your environment without being too overwhelmed. So I definitely get a lot of questions like that. I agree. Yeah. And you know, something that we see that's super interesting is that when you get started and actually clothing, especially baby clothing is not necessarily something really hard to start with. Right, like it's uh, it's something because mm -hmm. you get the benefits very quickly, right? Like, uh, um, you, you know, guess what? Like the best organic cotton brands are also the best yeah. quality, right? right. Like just like better products. You know, they're they're super soft. They have you really cute design. Like, uh, you're basically better off as a as a you know you you're getting a better product. So, um, and also and and that's the reason also why we started with baby clothing is that. Uh, the benefits are really high. Um, for example, sending back after use, you get to declutter. You know, you get to not have an overwhelming amount of clothing to uh, store uh, in your apartment, etc. So you're getting a lot of these benefits that are uh, basically reducing the, the the load of parenting. Uh, and what you're giving up is not huge, right? Like you're giving up keeping clothes in a in a closet that you might or might not reuse in a in a, in the future. Um, or you're giving up, you know, having, you know, the, we posted something like a few weeks ago saying the worst advice in baby clothing is you can never have mm -hmm. enough, you know, baby clothes. And it's like the worst advice because that's not, not, not only creating tons of clutter and waste, but it's really creating a lot of headache and things to, to manage for the parent afterwards, right? Like you spend so many hours uh, just figuring out what to do with, I mean, not just like the laundry part, but also, you know, storing and what do you do after, after use and do you donate and if yes, where, and do you sell? And if yes, you know, you have to, to, to manage this whole process and it becomes really, um, really overwhelming. Um, uh, so it's something that is easy enough to, you know, to start with. And we see a lot of people then say, um, now I want to do this for other parts of my yeah. life or my house, right? Because I've seen firsthand the benefits of that. So sometimes we, we're asked like, oh, it would be great if you were doing this for, um, you know, this, I don't know, mm -hmm. maternity clothing or toys, or whatever it is, um, because they get, so, so it's also like a good dynamic to get yourself into because you're, you're starting to get the benefits and you want the, those benefits to, to exist in, in other parts um, of your life. But the other thing that, you know, I would mention that makes it, quite challenging for new parents um, compared to adults. So th there's more urgency, let's say, when it comes to baby clothing, because people understand very well that, you know, babies need more protection and they're more fragile. It's not something that's d difficult to understand. It's also something that you don't need a company to tell you that you sh like that, that is something you should care about. Right. Um, at the same time, there's a lot more that you don't control, uh, especially on the gifting side. So we do have like a lot of members who get even very passionate about using up shoes, uh, but they get this constant stream of like gifts or hand-me-downs. And at some point they're uh, facing that, you know, situation or like, yeah, I want to use those fabrics. That's why I signed up for up shoes. But then I've just gotten my cousin drop, dropping all these gifts or all these hand-me-downs, uh, which is very, very rarely, you know, uh, certified organic cotton brands, for example. Uh, so parents get challenged in very, you know, unique ways. Um, and, uh, and so there's, there, there's that for, for new parents, which we, we're mm -hmm. trying to navigate with them. Yeah, as well. no, absolutely. I mean, there comes into so many points that you said, I mean, the overconsumption is just something that we're seeing across the board in all areas of our lives, but especially when it comes to children's clothing, because of how quickly they grow, you don't need to have a million pieces all the time and to be able to have somewhere.
size are failing because that is figuring out what to do with clothing when you're not using them anymore you're grown out of them it can be just yeah. a wild west of do i sell them do i donate them people say that donating doesn't even go to the right cause it's so overwhelming so i mean you're really there and yeah you no, know go what, ahead. sorry yeah 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 no i, I, I was going to say what's what's what i found really interesting the more you know i i the overconsumption, which is what leads to you know clutter and waste, uh, isn't so much or isn't only the, the the result of wanting too much and getting too much, right? It's not just the quantity issue of like I'm so excited I'm buying everything mm -hmm. that I find I cannot resist. Uh, there is that, but there's also something else that is usually uh, more like uh, subtle, which is you really don't know exactly what mm -hmm. you are going to need for each size. Right. You know, like every baby has um, unique right. growth patterns. So, for example, you might buy a certain number of, uh, let's say, you know, newborn size or zero to three month size. Um, but then, you know, baby's not gonna, like, maybe it's gonna just mm -hmm. skip, you know, through that size very, very quickly. And so those clothes are gonna very quickly become clutter and waste. Um, and so that's why, like, we try to do that as, as, as a service. Um, to be as flexible and to adapt as much as possible to the you know baby's growth patterns that's a big way to reduce waste and clutter uh, and, and it's really to reduce inefficiencies because you know you don't know in advance you might you might need two weeks worth of a certain size and then mm -hmm. three months worth of another size and if you have purchased in advance or been gifted the opposite right like three months worth of the size that you're going to end right. up only using two weeks and then only two weeks worth of a size that you need for three months. Not only you've created waste and clutter on the one hand, but you you actually right. not you, you don't mm -hmm. even have enough of what you actually need, you know, need. Um, and so that's something that is just like a really interesting problem to yeah. to try to address. Um, and is to is to help also people think less about the product, which is clothing, right? Like purchasing, even even renting, right? Mm -hmm. Like we often get uh, defined as a clothing rental service. Uh, and, and so that's not really right. the purpose, right? That's just a tool. Like you, you mm -hmm. can rent, meaning you pay for usage, but the real purpose is a flexible, you know, way to, uh, get to the outcome, which is right. dressing your baby, right? That's what you want. And sometimes those two things don't, uh, overlap perfectly, right? Like you might think, for example, if you're buying a gift, say you're buying, uh, 10 pieces of clothing to a new parent in one size, right? Uh, in your mind, if I ask you, are you buying clothes or are you, uh, helping dress the baby? You might say, well, that's the same thing, but if that size isn't used or isn't needed, you've actually not achieved at all, you know, the real purpose, which is dressing the baby. Mm -hmm. You've just bought, you know, clothing. So there's, and because there's this like unpredictability and variation in growth patterns, those two things often don't coincide. Um, and so that's a really like a, a driver of, uh, of a lot of the, of the clutter and waste in, you know, in children clothing. I know we don't have like tons of time, so I'm. I want to go back to something that is really the reason why I uh, contacted you in the first place, um, which I'd love your comment on. I think you wrote something that was, uh, you know, perfectly articulated where you said, uh, mm -hmm. I think it was something like PSA sustainable doesn't mean non-toxic. Uh, I'd love to have your about that and, and, and why did you uh, write that? Thank you. I'm glad that that was helpful because that is something that I have found is a big misconception. We have seen such a big growth in the sustainability mo movement in the past couple of years, especially in clothing, that has been thought to because something is more sustainable, it must be healthier for me. But if you're talking about sustainability, it means literally to sustain, to keep something the way that it is. And the movement has been in order to keep our earth the way it is, keep our environment the way it is, because we are using so many resources, we are polluting so many areas of, we are losing the health of our world. And so the movement of sustainability is to keep everything the way it is in an environmental sense, looking at carbon emissions, looking at water waste and water pollution and all of these aspects, which is in turn healthier for our world. It isn't healing the world though. And that's where we see the next step of, if you ever heard of regenerative farming and practices, and that's more about talking about healing it. So sustaining is that first step of let's stop what we're doing and keep things in the place that we are now, and then we can regenerate and then we can heal. But then as we're seeing that in clothing, you know, clothing companies are using more pieces that are plant-based and that are, you know, presumably healthier for the environment and then also for our bodies and for clothing makers. However, sustainable does not mean that it needs to be non-toxic or even healthy. And I think there's a big difference between non-toxic and healthy to non-toxic. Again, it's just removing toxins sure there aren't any 
And that healthy is actually that next step of healing the body. And so even there, there's a big difference as well. And so when you see things like recycled plastic, which is a sustainable movement or just recycling in general, again, that's just not using new materials and that's using old mm. materials, but that is a highly intensive process with toxic chemicals in order to first make plastic into clothing, but then to recycle it into clothing. And in the recycling process, there's so much cross-contamination. So in that sense, it's sustainable. And the fact that we're not using new materials where you have available resources in our world, but it's not non-toxic. It's not healthy for the body. It can actually be even more toxic than if you were just using virgin plastic in clothing. And so there are some brands that are looking at that health impact on consumer makers, but that is not what sustainable means and it's not an umbrella so if they're doing that it's a great ad but that's not you know what is required when you're talking about something that's sustainable and so that's where we see this next step of looking at chemical usage um, chemical management by companies that make sure all the ingredients if you will used in your clothing production process are non-toxic on the body and that's step one is kind of actually heal heal the body. And that's something that we're starting to see when companies are using items like seaweed, which actually has nutrient dense um, qualities in it. And so it's, it's really the stepwise function of sustainable environment keeps us where we are. We're not using a lot of extra resources. We're not polluting our world, but then we need that next step of management to see what are we actually using that can impact our body. And then the next step of that is something that can we even heal our world and can we even heal our bodies through the clothes that we're wearing. So a lot of it seems to get grouped all under the same umbrella, just because that's really the, the marketing, the greenwashing that's all being used at the moment. But they're all very different aspects um, that I think a company, if they're saying they're sustainable, if they're not completely looking at that aspect, they might say, oh, well, I can say it's benefits, but it's really a lot of different areas needed in that production process in order to actually make it all of those different things. So it's a big misconception. Um, and I think it's just really where the world fashion is going is toward this non-toxic and even healthy um, production of clothing. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I think also something that's very vicious almost is that we've been pushed to focus on single, almost single issues to address absolutely. sustainability. So sometimes we're we're you know and and we see that all the time like um sometimes it's all for second hand or mm -hmm. for organic or for locally made or um and like in our case for example in our model we have both new and second hand like you can choose to have new and you can just choose to have second hand and a very interesting conversation i have every now and then is someone saying um like oh i'm i'm of course i'm picking second hand as part of like using up shoes because i care about sustainability and and, and and, and, and we usually respond well in our model, the two right. are uh, working together, you know, to create that, that model, because if anything, because we focus exclusively on, on certified organic cotton brands, and that's such a small part of the market, we have to create that supply of second hand and to create that supply of second hand, you need, you know, the new uh, as well. And so to me, it's much better to not get caught in, in that, uh, to offer both new and second hand. If the model itself as, as a result is targeting the, the, the root causes of the issues, right? Which is, for example, uh, avoiding excess in the first place, right? Like reducing excess Absolutely. before it even gets, you know, created. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something that we got, we, we, we get caught on a lot, which is just thinking about one issue. Uh, if it's only secondhand or only organic or only, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, locally made, for example, but, but really we try to look at it in a more, you know, holistic way. Um, so look, I, I, uh, I, I didn't see the time pass. So, you know, it was really, really super interesting. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to close by saying, um, I mean, obviously if you have anything, you know, you would like to close, but I want to give you a chance to just tell anyone who's interested in your work. I mean, obviously anyone interested in UpChoose, if you want to use UpChoose or if you just are thinking about your options and you have questions about baby clothing, you know, DM us, email us, uh, uh, tag us, you know, we want to be of service, but with regards to your work, if anyone wants to learn more about you, if anyone wants to, uh, you know, get your guide, like, yeah, where, absolutely. You know. So definitely, you know, connect with me on Instagram. Um, and then I have a website called day to Eve that I'm compiling all non-toxic clothing brands as well as some lifestyle brands to make it easier for consumers to find those non-toxic options all in one spot. You know, I've done the research for you. You can just know that these brands are vetted and cleaner choice. So definitely check that out. That's where my guide is, is as well. Um, and feel free to reach out with any questions. I'm always happy to answer questions or make content on various questions that people have. So I appreciate your time and it's been a wonderful conversation. Thank definitely. you so much. Okay. Hopefully yes, the first absolutely. Thank you. Okay, great. You too. Have a wonderful rest of Bye. your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.